I've also been involved in some other interesting cases. This is an interesting one. A Motorola employer, employee got a tumor which he claimed was caused by the phones he was testing in the course of his work. And it eventually was dismissed. I mean, the guy did have a brain tumor. That was unfortunate. The amazing thing is, he sued Motorola. They kept him on the payroll for years while he was suing them. Then there's another one in this local area between Christopher Newman and Motorola. He got a brain tumor and he claimed he was a, a big cell phone user and he got the brain tumor as a result. And this went to a hearing in Baltimore and this was also dismissed. And to date, nobody has ever won a lawsuit against any cell phone company or provider or you name it, claiming that that's what, what caused their, their brain tumor. What, okay. Why is that? I mean, what was the um, defense's um, argument? Well, the defense was that there has to be a cause of the tumor. You've got to identify what's the mechanism by which the radiation causes the tumor. And there was no mechanism. And those of us who were helping defend the phone companies were able to show scientifically that the evidence was so overwhelming in favor of there being no mechanism for this phenomenon that the judge judged that there really was no case to answer. Now, this did not go to a jury trial. I mean, here's the thing. Cases occasionally, they've never gone to a jury trial. Cases that go to jury trials, then of course you're at, under mercy of 12 jurors who quite often might not understand what's going on. And then you, you really worry that you can get jury bias, but it hasn't happened to date. Even so, the state of Maine right now is trying to get regulations passed to put a cell, a, warn, a health warning on all cell phones, like they do on packets of cigarettes. Did you have a question? Well, yeah, I have a whole lot of questions, but okay. I'll just wait until we... Sure. And, you know, right now, I think it's... Senator Voinovich wants to have all cell phones indicate their exposure values, these SAR values, so that consumers can pick ones with the lowest values. Well, this is totally misleading because cell phones have different exposure values, but they're all way below the safety standard set by the FCC. And it may well be that ones with the lower values might be slightly high-tech phones because it's in nobody's interest to have more energy go out of the phone than is necessary because the phone is more efficient and doesn't have to broadcast as much energy and the battery lasts longer. You know, so there are good things to keep in the exposure levels low, but it's not for health reasons. It's for other practical reasons. You, you might also add that uh, the city of San Francisco has instituted uh, warnings and posted labels. I don't have the, I didn't, I heard about that, but I didn't think it had actually happened yet. It was passed with only one dissension on a 12 person. Uh, this is a very important slide, if you start being scientific about this. I owe this to my colleague Jim Weaver at MIT. If you want a cell phone to do something to your biology, there has to be this sequence of events. Because bio biological events actually have underlying chemistry. And chemical effects, in reality, have underlying physics. Because chemical reactions involve bonds breaking and rearranging and new molecules being formed. So, if there's no physical interaction that can do anything, there isn't going to be any chemistry, and there isn't going to be any biology. And this is the very important sequence that you don't get magical effects at the biological level unless you have these precursor events. So at a physical level, you ask yourself, well, what are the possible ways that the radiation from a cell phone might cause problems? Well, there's definitely some heating when you use a cell phone. I mean, it's a mini microwave oven. However, people have studied this very carefully. It appears that the highest temperature you could produce anywhere in your brain, even with a maximum power cell phone, is maybe two-tenths of a degree. Now, if you drink a cup of hot coffee, you will elevate the temperature of your brain more than that. 
If you go jogging, you will elevate the temperature of your brain more, that, more than that. If you get a fever, you're going to elevate your body temperature by a couple of degrees. And believe it or not, there's a lot of evidence that people have cancer remission following a very, very high fever. Because tumors frequently can't handle high temperatures as well as healthy tissue. So again, this all speaks against heating being an issue. Okay? Now, the other possibility is in your body, you have all kinds of ions that are responsible for nerve signals and neural signals. You know, and we have these important things like sodium ions, potassium ions, and calcium ions that move in, inside cells and cross tissue boundaries, and you name it. Well, if you ask yourself, could a microwave field from a cell phone do anything to those ions? Because charged particles will move when you apply an electric field to them. Well, it turns out that at cell phone frequencies, which are up around a billion cycles per second, as soon as an ion is pulled one way by the field, it has to get pulled back in the other direction because the field is changing direction a billion times a second. So the ion, if it does anything, just jiggles. Well, you can calculate how much it jiggles. It doesn't even jiggle by the size of an atomic nucleus because the inertia of the ion stops it going anywhere. Okay? Now, could you get the breakage of chemical bonds? Well, the weakest bonds in the body are about a thousand times stronger than the energy that's associated with microwave radiation. You see, radiation, we all talk about electromagnetic waves as what's involved. But if you look at it a little bit more deeply, if you start going into quantum theory, and I'm not going to try and teach you quantum theory, but you find that the electromagnetic field actually comes in little packets of energy that we call photons. And each photon has a certain amount of energy. And if the photon has enough energy and it bangs into a, an atom or into a molecule, it can break a bond if it has enough energy. But the photon cell phones are a thousand times smaller than what you'd need to break the weakest bond in the body. So it really is implausible that non-ionizing radiation of this kind can break chemical bonds. And of course, you need to break chemical bonds to make that transition to some chemistry and then some biology. Now, it's a fact. If you go and take an x-ray of somebody or expose them to ionizing radiation, those photons have huge energy, and they break bonds. And of course, you know, you get exposed to this stuff all the time. You know, fly from here to Denver. Cosmic rays at 5,000 feet will break some of the bonds in your DNA. But our bodies are incredibly good at repairing themselves. And even those breaks that are caused by ionizing radiation get repaired very, very rapidly. Okay? But there are definitely risks associated with ionizing radiation. Now, we began to look at this whole issue of, is there any other mechanism by which cell phones could interact with human tissue? Now, the point is that cell phones have a particular frequency, but that frequency is modulated in order to carry the voice or the data or the pictures or whatever you're transmitting. And we talk about the main frequency that's sitting there. We call it the carrier frequency. But it has frequencies around it that carry the data that we call sidebands. So this is true for radio. If you, look at an F, if, you could look at a, if you listen to an FM radio station at, say, 100 megahertz, when they talk about that 100 megahertz, that's the carrier frequency from the station. But there are small variations of the frequency around that value that your radio decodes and translates back into voice or music. But there's no low frequencies themselves involved. You know, there's no low frequencies come out of a cell phone antenna. Just radio frequencies, which vary a little bit, about a center frequency. And, and in fact, this is an example of what I mean. If you take a center frequency and you encode data on it, you get these patterns of frequencies around the, the sides that tell you about what's been encoded into that frequency. And these are examples for frequency modulation, which is the way that FM radio stations work. Now, cell phones quite often use this technique that's called GSM. If you have AT&T or T-Mobile as your provider right now, they use this type of signaling. It stands for global system mobiliere or something like that. 
It's a European standard, but it's a worldwide standard. And it's rather complex the way they encode the data on the signal. And if you look at it, there's lots and lots of these frequencies near the carrier that are carrying the data in these encoded cell phone conversations. Okay? Now, this again is to illustrate why the photons from cell phones don't do anything. We are all happily living at about 37 degrees C. That's our body temperature. And we actually have thermal energy in our body. And the thermal energy has a characteristic value. If you like, it's the random jiggling of all the molecules in your body that store a certain amount of energy. Well, that random jiggling, okay, is very random. But again, the energy is associated with the thermal energy in your body is actually about 8,000 times bigger than what you get from a cell phone. So your ordinary thermal energy in your body and how much energy it has with it, it's like 8,000 times above a cell phone. And here's a snapshot. This is characteristic thermal energy, this great big bar here. Scientifically, we call it KT. T is the temperature, and K is the thing called Boltzmann's constant. Well, if you blow up the bottom bit down here, there's your cell phone photon. It's tiny compared to the thermal energies that are present. These are some simulations of mine where I took a cell phone, which actually had more power than is currently allowed. I had a half watt cell phone. These days, most of them are only two tenths of a watt. And I calculated if you took that entire half watt and you focused it into the brain, into the smallest possible volume possible, how much heating would you get? And here we are, over an hour, it was about half a degree. This calculation doesn't include the cooling from blood flow, the fact that the phone isn't actually focused into your head. So this is just showing physically that there really isn't any heating caused by a cell phone. Now, those of the community who want to believe there's still a problem, they have coined this term, well, the mechanism that does you in is an athermal mechanism. It's something magical that happens. Even if you don't heat anything up, something happens, okay? Well, the problem is, how do you explain it? You know, this is like saying it's magic, you know, and I don't believe in magic. Scientists, by and large, don't believe in magic. And if there was such a phenomenon, how would you ever explain or incorporate it into a safety standard? You know, it's like saying, well, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? You know, can I buy a protective suit to keep my guardian angel away? You know, and there is some discussion in the medical community at the moment about does heating of the body have any health consequences? And there are some people out there, I don't think they're in a majority, that believe that if a pregnant woman has a fever at a certain critical stage, I think in the first trimester, I'm not quite sure exactly what weeks it is, there's some evidence that increased risk of birth abnormalities. But I don't think that finding is totally robust. And again, that's based on elevating the whole body by a couple of degrees. Okay? So I guess I can't answer that specifically, whether heating you up a lot has any risks or not. Because I say, most physicians don't believe this, but there are a few out there who worry about it. Now, one possible mechanism that a few people have suggested, because, you know, they're clutching at straws. They want to show that there is a health risk. And those of us on the other side have been saying, well, you've got to tell us what the mechanism is. Because if there's no mechanism for interaction, you don't get the physics, you don't get the chemistry, you don't get the biology. Well, what they'd suggested was that brain, brain tissue can work like a radio receiver. There's something about biological cells that makes them act like diodes. A diode is a nonlinear electrical device needed in the front end of every radio to take the RF frequency and decode out those lower frequencies of voice or whatever that are associated with it. Now, I would agree if this demodulation effect occurred, it would put low frequencies into your brain. And lower frequencies are a whole new ball game compared to microwave frequencies because low frequency electromagnetic fields, in principle, can move ions in the tissue about. So they might affect cell transport processes or communications that synapses in your brain. I mean, I'm not suggesting this does happen, but
but you have to allow this possibility. So it was very important to see whether this actually occurred.